Do you have a sense for metabolic health, again, for cleaning up our metabolic system, which is a huge problem right now? What length fast do you feel like does that the best? That's a very loaded question because... <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's the one I get all the time. No, I mean, it's the... Let's put it this same way as you would take a medication. So, for example, if someone has diabetes or pre-diabetes and is prescribed a medication, commonly prescribed, say, metformin. There is no single dose of metformin that should be applicable to everybody because if somebody is newly diagnosed pre-diabetic, maybe somebody should take 500 milligram of metformin. And if someone already has diabetes, maybe higher dose. And if somebody has really severe diabetes, then maybe two or three medications. So... We have to put that into context. So similarly, for someone who has metabolic disease, and when we think metabolic disease, you know, it's a very fuzzy term, but we can break it down to individual components. So typically, the three things that affect us that we really are concerned about are blood glucose, blood cholesterol, blood pressure. In blood cholesterol, we can say blood lipids, cholesterol and total triglyceride. Then we can add, say, abdominal obesity because that predisposes us to many different diseases. So so now let's think about obesity and high blood pressure, high blood cholesterol, high blood sugar. So depending on who has what and how severe it is, then one can have, one can begin with certain amount of fasting. The other thing is we, when we are predisposed or we develop certain metabolic disease, it develops because of our interaction between genes and our lifestyle. Mm. And many of us do have bad genes, and that's inescapable. But then, in terms of lifestyle, we have developed our habit of eating certain things. We have preference for certain type of food, amount of food. Yes, It's not that easy to just start fasting right away. So that's why when we do our studies in humans, the first thing we want to see is, well, does timing actually, is timing contributing, mistiming of food contributing your disease, or is it something else? Like somebody may be already eating Mm. religiously, regularly within 10 hours window, but that person may already have metabolic disease or metabolic syndrome, so then there is not much room for improvement in that case, but paying attention to food Mm. quality and quantity might matter. Whereas if someone who is already eating at a window of, say, 14 hours, I'm not saying that every day this person eats within 14 hours, just imagine... And the last two weeks, one is the earliest time you ate, and one is the last time, latest, how late did you eat? And if that is uh, six o'clock in the morning, some I woke up and had a cup of coffee with cream and sugar and something else to munch, and then the last time I ate over the last two weeks was going out for dinner and having a very late dinner, say, at least a couple of times in the last two weeks, say at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. So that gives me already 15, 16 hours of window within which my body was expecting food. So in that case, Mm. reducing that eating time to a narrow interval might benefit. Because it's a change? Is that because you're switching no, because, it from what you're yeah, regularly because doing? Habitually or randomly over the last two weeks, if I have eaten two or three times before 8 a.m. in the morning, two or three times after 8 p.m. in the evening. So that means my body is already used to expecting food between 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Body has already gotten this right. signal that okay, so this person is likely to eat within such a long window of time. Yes, the body remembers it. So in that case, reducing that timing to a shorter time can be beneficial. So then the question is, well, can I just go to <laughs> six hours or two hours or three hours, which will be a huge shock, and people may not be able to stick to it. So that's why. We always suggest, well, if it is too difficult, try one week within sticking to a 12-hour window that works for you. 
depending mm. on what time you wake up, what time you go to bed, and what you do in the morning or evening, try to find a 12 hours that works for you. It's not saying that you should start skipping breakfast, eating at <laughs> from noon to eight o'clock, but select your own window. And then if, if you get used to it for a week or two, then you can reduce it to 10 hours. Because both mouse studies and human studies <laughs> that we do, we are seeing that when people who have a habitual or usual eating window of 14 hours or longer, so that means over the last two weeks, you have eaten at least two or three meals within that 14 hours window, suppose say 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., so that will give you 14 hours, or 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., that will give you 14 hours or longer. Mm -hmm. Then reducing that to 10 hours seems to give many benefits. And so that's the starting point. You start with 12 hours, and then if you can reduce it to 10 hours, then that's a good thing. And some people try to reduce even to eight hours or six hours. I must say that we, when we look at really objective data, because we have done this study on many hundreds of people now, and some people say that they can do eight hours, and they start. And after five or six weeks, we see them drifting towards 10 hours, and then kind mm. of stabilizing around 10 hours. So that's why we feel like 10 hours is a magic spot where you can have long-term compliance, long-term adherence. But if you can do eight hours, that's also good enough. So I think when people reduce it too much, and this is what we have seen in few cases, particularly with women, uh, because women, <laughs> I should not say this, but many women want to have it all. So they will start intermittent fasting or time eating. They want to eat within say six to eight hours. They want to improve the quality of food. So they end up eating only salad and they reduce their nutrient, con nutrient intake. And, yes. and then they yes. go on, they go for four miles, five miles run four times, five times a week. And then what happens is your yes. body is actually into a shock because your body is not getting enough nutrient, enough energy to sustain very basal metabolic processes that your body needs. And this usually happens yes. mostly with normal weight people or slightly overweight people who are trying to have it all. And if, you, if women are still menstruating, then they should they would see irregular menstrual cycle or some of them can even become amenorrheic. And that's a good sign that you are getting mm -hmm. into an energy deficit that's not supporting basal function in your body. That's why we rarely ask people to reduce their the eating window to less than eight hours because there is some risk unless you're paying attention to your quality and quantity of nutrition and physical activity along with it. That can be a respect. So, sorry, that was a very long answer. Yeah, no, that was really well said and actually backs up a lot of my work and what I've done with, with women specifically is make sure that we don't get at, at, at certain times of the menstrual cycle too much in this calorie deficit place. And it's specifically around the hormone progesterone doesn't do well when we're in too much of a glucose restricted state. And the thyroid doesn't do well with consistent calorie calorie restriction. So I like for women to have a, a more cycling according to where their hormonal profile is and what, what's going on, whether they're menopausal or menstruating. 